I'll be brief. Oh. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Uh, I'm Michael Bedford. I'm from uh, Lincoln, Rhode Island. I'm a transplant from California about six years ago. I moved to Rhode Island for work purposes, and um, you know, I was compelled to come to you today and talk about uh, some of the bills that are being proposed. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the, the, the magazine limitation. I know that I've listened through eight hours of various testimony, and I thought it was all very impressive, uh, particularly you, Mr. Uh, Representative Knight, regarding the, the seeking for root cause, you know, trying to get to the core of these issues. Uh, both this particular piece of legislation and 5345 uh, was stated multiple times that its true purpose is to cut down on the amount of carnage, the, the, the liability of the impact of an issue. And I want to talk about some of the quotes that came from the AG's office, because I think they're a little misleading and, and maybe talking out both sides of their mouth there. Uh, they, they first said that we, the AG's office was against the, uh, the CCW enhancement bill uh, because we believe that the Rhode Island has one of the most stringent background checks and, and method of processing. The same people that we put through this very stringent process that we think is the best in the world or best in the country, um, that we don't want to trust in other states' reciprocity, we will say that they're not able to, to go into school because we, we think they're deaf and, and could uh, accidentally discharge. And I think that's a little uh, kind of having both sides of the, uh, the argument there. Uh, the second thing the AG said is that, uh, if I quoted these stats correctly, that there are been zero mass shootings in, in Rhode Island and zero accidental discharges in Rhode Island. Uh, and it was a, fact, a, a statement that they made when, when asked for that. So if we have a law that's there to prohibit guns in school from CCW carriers, where we've said there's no problem, there isn't something that's been identified as an issue, then, then why have the legislation? Um, in, in fact, when you go back to the magazine limitation issue altogether, uh, you know, uh, Representative Knight, you mentioned that there was a split second in the Sandy Hook shooting where the, the perpetrator was reloading their weapon and it allowed for two people to escape. And, and that was justification. It, it, sa it could save lives. And I, I don't doubt that. But okay. given that we had zero instances of these mass shootings and zero issues of accidental shootings within Rhode Island, then who is really going to be impacted by this? If everybody up here is saying, and the coalition even mentioned, that, that that's such a rare and remote possibility of this ever being an issue, then who is affected by this legislation? It's not the schools. You're not solving the problem with carnage in schools or the massive impact by limiting the magazine. What you're doing is the more likely scenario where a gun is used all the time is for defense purposes in the home environment. And we've heard testimony from people who, if you have one magazine at the nightstand, then what you basically did is limit my chance of success in fending off an attack. You're not solving the problem with the schools. You're, you're not solving the issues of mitigating carnage because we've proven, and it's been statistically shown, that people that are interested in those things have ways to get around that. All you're doing is placing undue burden on me as a homeowner and as somebody who wants to defend my family by saying that there's a limitation on 10 rounds. It might make you feel better, but it doesn't bring security. It doesn't add anything to the equation that I think is worth the trade-off. So I think, uh, although I understand where this is coming from, I believe the legislation is flawed in its attempt to try to solve the problem. It's not the answer. It clearly is not. Uh, the other thing I, I like to mention is regarding the, you know, the guns in school. I, I have a 16-year-old uh, a now. It's hard for me to actually say that because you know, where the time go. Uh, and he attends Lincoln High School. And... Uh, you know, we, we've been asking teachers, well, how do you feel about this? We've been asking school committees, how do you feel about guns in school? Did you ever ask the kids what they thought? You know, they see the same news as we do. They see all these stories in the newspaper. Uh, they're tuned in and nervous. Uh, the, the gentleman that was up here at the very beginning, I, I forget his name, I, I didn't write it down, but he testified that uh, his six-year-old son was almost traumatized because his uh, teacher had made a statement that a concealed weapon in his desk and he had nightmares, anxiety. Uh, I can tell you through my personal experience that my son has anxiety because until we as Rhode Island are going to protect our kids in school, which there aren't any armed officers in that school, they have anxiety that these situations could happen to them. So what is the answer we're telling our kids when if you go to school, we know we can't protect you because we don't have armed officers in that school. We know there could be guns in the school because we're not doing any type of metal detection at all. It's too cost prohibitive. But we're going to take the, the, the remote possibility that somebody might have a concealed weapon. The only chance that you're going to be for successful defense and you're going to throw that away. It doesn't move the needle in the right direction. In fact, it moves it in the other direction. So until you get to a place and that you can say confidently, we have proper protections like we enjoy here in the State House. Uh, one of the uh, representatives asked, do you feel safe? coming into the state house. 
Hell yeah, I feel safe coming to the state house. We have the best people, the state troopers there. Can we afford to put them in schools? Can we afford to put armed officers in schools uh, with metal detectors and everything that we have here, that we, the peace and the enjoyment that we have here of safety? No, we can't. And until we're willing to solve that problem with those type of means, then my answer is, yeah, there might be just a remote chance that somebody could be the hero of the day. But I'll take that remote chance over the certainty they have zero chance if they have to wait 10 minutes for, or more for the arrival of a peace officer. It's not even equivalent. Even if it just moves a little bit further, until you can address those issues, this is a non-issue for me. It's not even a discussion. It's like you can't provide a safe environment, at least you don't prohibit it from being a safe environment. That, to me, is common sense. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I uh, the last couple of things here, again, I'll try to zoom through it. Uh, we haven't really talked about the uh, 5262 and 5263 as it affects minors. Uh, again, my son is 16. Uh, he actually, when he was uh, 15, <coughs> on his birthday, he received his own first fire shot. Uh, we're, we're big uh, gun owners in our family. It's been a tradition. It's a rite of passage, you know, that for his birthday, he received a, a shotgun. And we do clay shooting, we do hunting, we do a lot of things with that. But it was his own weapon. And what that allowed me to do as a parent was to have my son learn responsibly how to manage and own firearms. With the change in this law, you're making it illegal for the simple possession of that same shotgun. And what are you doing to some of I understand the AG's office, they want to promote this as a way to take the guns out of the hands of, or uh, prosecute gang members that hand the guns down to, to use minors. I don't know about that problem. That's not a problem in my house. But I do know that what I do as a parent is I promote responsible gun usage in our home. And my son owns his very own firearm. And he cleans it, he maintains it. He does everything that a responsible 15 year old that's soon to be an adult would ever do with a firearm. Do not allow me to that right to allow me to teach my son to be a responsible gun owner. And that what happens when you have to be turned 18? We have to give them the tools to be successful. We've taken them away. So you're not able to, to have this, you're not able to have a training wheels on. And we're going to throw you out there and say, oh, you're 18, now you go buy a gun. And God will be a member of your next talk to you with, uh, with the answer. It's just not right. So I understand the problem we're trying to address is gay violence and things like that. Uh, but the answer in my book is AG needs to do a better job of prosecution. That's not my problem at all. That's their problem. Don't take my right as a father or as somebody that's responsible for that. Uh, and the last thing that I'll mention is I didn't mention I was a transplant from California. Uh, my office is actually, I work as a chief information security officer. So I'm the executive leader for a company that's based out of Boston, Massachusetts. So I work at Boston, Massachusetts, the company that I work for, I live in California, the same company I work for now. Uh, but I chose to live in Rhode Island. Now, I get to endure that commute every day, which I tell you, it's no fun. Uh, and why? It's because I made a choice when looking at the options of location coming from California. I chose to go it because of our gun laws. Because we believe in embracing responsible gun ownership. When you're so quick to compare yourself to Massachusetts, Connecticut, and some of the New England states, don't make the automatic assumption. Just say one. Don't make the automatic assumption that that comparison is a good thing. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I've learned in my six years at Rhode Island that Rhodes are a very proud people. Very proud. And, 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 you know, love their traditions, love our way of life. We're not Massachusetts. We don't, live, we don't operate the same way. I go back and forth every day. I work with people. And they're certainly not Californians. But I can assure you that the reason that I live in this great state is because we embrace the Second Amendment. And I brought my tax monies, my earnings into this state. So there is a financial implication to becoming more restrictive on things out of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that you have to also... What type of person like me who's saying, I've got to move to New England for work-related reasons. I can choose all these different states. Why can't that be Rhode Island? And so it is a deciding factor. I don't know that how... I don't have any statistics. I can only speak from my own personal experience. But I'm glad I made that choice that I wouldn't go back again. Um, Massachusetts is a little too far-fetched for me. The, you know, the California, I, I came from that environment that was just very oppressive. So I understand what we're trying to do with some of these bills. I think in some cases they are misguided. There have been uh, at least one example that uh, Representative um, Wilkinson, Bella Wilkinson had brought up uh, that I thought was probably the only one I saw on the agenda that actually tried to get to the root cause. And that is gun violence by the bad people. 
not prohibiting or making felons or criminals out of me, a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen of this state who is peaceful in every term, but yet all these laws, all they do is put more prohibition on my ability to exercise my rights. That bill that you're sponsoring uh, or representing regarding the, the punishment and deterrent factor uh, was the only one I saw that really got to the heart of how do you punish their criminals and yet leave the law-abiding citizens to be able to enjoy their peace. And, and that's where really what I think is, is a fair thing. So I'll stop there because I promise to be brief and ask open for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from Michael?